Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. My name is Maggie Caesar. I'm the Senior Customer Marketing Manager for eBuilder. Thank you for joining us today. So this is the, uh, we're starting a two part um, series here. We're on week five of a six webinar series and we're gonna have two episodes, one this week and one next week. Today's title is Project Restarts and the Impact to Budgets and Schedules. All right, so at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan Connery and Matt Sprague with our product marketing department. Excellent, so thank you, Maggie, and thanks everyone for attending today. As we were putting together this original concept, we thought we would get this all done in one webinar, and as we continue to dive into the topic, we realized there's no way we could do this in one hour, so we decided to introduce episode one and two. I'm super excited uh, from a speaker perspective, uh, and for those who attended prior versions of this, this is going to be very different. Uh, normally, it's just a conversation between Matt and myself and a group of panelists. And, and this week, as we're making this transition, as people are getting ready to go back to the office, as projects are put on hold, are starting to start up again, we thought we would reach out rather than customers to industry experts. So I'm really, really excited and honored to be joined by uh, Donna with Dodge Data and Analytics and Greg from FMI. So I'm not gonna uh, butcher their introductions because they both have a, a slide to talk about themselves in their sessions. So don't wanna waste time on me, wanna get right to Donna's presentation. So Donna will go first and then Greg will come in and talk. So we're gonna disappear for a little bit while Donna does, a, does her presentation. So we'll be back in a bit. And before I disappear, um, just wanna make sure that everybody is looking at their control panel, sees the areas that they can add the questions in. Um, I'll be manning the questions the entire time, and, and like Dan mentioned before, uh, uh, we'll, we'll take some questions uh, after Donna's presentation, um, uh, specifically about hers, and then some questions from Greg after his, uh, and then any that don't get answered, we'll try to get answers for you uh, offline. And I'm leaving now. All right, well, thank you very much, Matt and Dan, for that introduction, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm with Dodge Data and Analytics. I'm the Industry Insights Research Director there. Um, I've been with Dodge for over 25 years. I've been in this role for about 10 years, which is largely being the managing editor of the Smart Market Report series. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Dodge Data and Analytics. But uh, just in case there's um, anyone who's not, obviously we are the um, largest um, company that is supplying in construction information to North America. Uh, hopefully many of people on the call are also familiar with suites. Um, I do seem to be having a little technical problem with advancing my slides. Let's see. I see your mouse moving. Try it again, make sure you're clicked in the presentation. Using the down button. There we go. There we go, okay. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, uh, but a lot of people don't are not that familiar with uh, Dodge Data and Analytics research and um, analysis capabilities. And where I sit is possibly one of the least known aspects of Dodge Data and Analytics, providing market research and industry insights and trends. And uh, we publish these in the Smart Market Report series. The goal of these is to quantify the business value and challenges of key trends that are most impacting the industry. And you can see a list of a lot of the different topics that we've covered over the years. And the nice thing about it is we work with industry partners, um, including eBuilder on some of these reports, to, um, to actually put together um, these reports for free. They're available for free download at construction.com. So um, if you pull nothing else away from my presentation, um, the, the uh, report I'll be talking about today is available at construction.com backslash toolkit backslash reports. So please note that. Um, so before I dive in though and explain what we've learned from contractors about how they're dealing with the COVID outbreak. I wanna pause and just very, very quickly go through the state of how things were. Just a quick reminder to help introduce um, where we are now. So the best way to do that is to look at the findings from the first quarter 
from the Commercial Construction Index. We actually conducted a survey with contractors quarterly, and in this case in January, through most of the month of January, and uh, it's about the, how their businesses are doing. And um, we put together an index number based on the ratio of back ideal to, um, to the actual backlog, based on their optimism about new business and based on their revenue expectations. And um, the, that number in Q Q1, in the January survey, was 74. That's 74 out of a scale of 100. That's pretty consistent with what we've seen in the last three years. And um, what the numbers reveal when you look at the components is that backlog is still pretty strong, that we see pretty consistent findings about new business, just a slight softening in Q1 2020 from what we saw in 2019 and that we continue to see some softening in revenue. But overall, the picture was very, very optimistic. And um, these were the things that people were worried about. This um, word map represents the answers to the question we asked, what is the single most important business concern you're facing in the next 12 months? This is what people thought their biggest concerns were gonna be. It was skilled labor, it was the economy, it was the election. Uh, there's a lot of concern on this chart in particular about poli the, the political environment and how it's going to impact the construction business. So that's where people's heads were in January. Um, obviously, everything now has changed. And when we started realizing the degree to which the change was going to be an ongoing thing for several months this year at least, we decided to conduct another survey of contractors, just Dodge, on our own. Um, and we did this using our contractor panel, which is the same group that we use to survey the contractors for the commercial construction index. We conducted the survey in the end of March. I think the timing is very important so that you understand the responses a little bit better because we've seen, we've actually got another survey, we're going, another commercial construction index we're gonna be publishing in June. And the findings from that are even a little bit stronger than what I'm going to show here. I can't talk about them yet, but um, you know, the idea is when you do these surveys is really critical right now. We surveyed 172 contractors, slightly more general contractors than trade contractors. And this survey covered four topics, the immediate impacts of the COVID-19 containment efforts, the longer term impacts expected, the expectations about an ability to weather extended job site closings, and the insurance and risk management strategies that they're considering. So what did we find out? Well, when I look at the immediate impacts of COVID-19, we see that by this period in March, late March, two thirds of contractors had already experienced at least some delays on their projects due directly to the COVID-19 containment efforts. But you, know, you can look at this in two ways. It's two thirds, that's a huge number. But at that point, one third had not yet experienced any delays. So, um, and when we looked at the reasons for the delays, there were five things that really emerged at the top were most frequently mentioned by them. The first one, and by far the most frequently mentioned was of course, government mandated closures that all their projects have been closed during to, due to the virus. Um, you know, some projects they've removed us from the site until further notice. But I do want to point out a little piece of data that Dodge reported on back in April. Um, we've had the numbers for our March starts for non-residential construction. Non-residential, as you can see from the chart, includes commercial, institutional, and manufacturing. And what you can see from this is that the March starts were still pretty healthy. That throughout the month of March, Dodge actually recorded a very typical number of starts for that month. In fact, if you compare that to the March in 2019, they're very similar. It's slightly down, but not meaningfully down. So um, we, by the end of March, we still had not seen the full impacts of these, of these starts. And it does also reflect the fact that the impacts on the construction industry have not been uniform across the country. We've really seen the area regional impacts that are very different. All right, so that's the first reason for the delays, government mandated closures. The second reason that they pointed out was issues with obtaining materials and equipment. 
And, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that they came under this category, including shipping and logistics issues, uh, impacts to the supply chain, being concerned about getting things from China, worry about the worry that suppliers aren't really fully staffed themselves with crews or have to keep their crews socially distant. So uh, delays in products will occur. The third point that they raised was worker availability. Um, they were very, they're still very concerned. Remember that labor skilled shortages was one of the biggest concerns before we went in. That really has not gone away in the current situation. And um, again, we see different flavors of that being reported by them, including some who've said that, you know, employees who become sick are not returning as quickly to the job site due to concerns. Uh, there's also that mention of fear or um, unavailability in place due to shelter in place orders. And, you know, a lot of the general contractors said that they were seeing employees of subcontractors not showing up for work as normal and an extreme impact on the schedule due to that. Um, we, they also saw, in addition to having government mandate enclosures, that owners were making the choice to delay or cancel projects. You know, either delays in jobs kickoff and decision making or owners requesting that they don't work on their projects, owner issues with employee health concerns being part of it. So um, again, we see a lot of different things, but you know, some real concerns that beyond the government mandates, it's the owners themselves that were resisting this. And then finally, permits and inspections were really proving to be a big challenge. A lot of them just could not get either the permitting they needed to start work or the inspections that they needed to complete it. So um, that's sort of what we saw right as a snapshot of what was going on. We also asked them to look a little bit further out and we asked them what they just thought the general impact was gonna be on their business from dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak. And um, you can see the chart rates, everyone the, 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 you know, who, who, who participated in the study uh, whether they said they saw a high, very high impact, a moderate impact, or low to no impact. And really what we see is that they, they, their expectations by the end of March were that they were going to see the biggest impacts in about three months. And the, the most recent study that we're still analyzing suggests that that's still the case, that the, the biggest impacts seem to be coming between March and June, um, that that's still where contractors put it. Um, by six months, though, I still want to point out that almost a third of the contractors are still expecting high or very high impacts on their business due to this outbreak. So it isn't just about projects starting back up. It's about the bigger picture, too, for a lot of them. So um, when we asked them to rate their top concerns, and they were asked to rate them on a scale of one to five. So what would you seeing here are the, the two people who rated it a four or five, which is either very concerned or extremely concerned. We do see that the biggest concern overall is that they're worried about a possible recession emerging from this. It's not even so much what's going on right in this immediate moment. It's what impact it's going to have on the pipeline moving forward. Uh, there also is at least half who were very to extremely concerned about the transmission of the virus. And it isn't among their workers. And it isn't just indoors. It isn't just, you know, people who are working together indoors. They are very worried about the transmission of the virus on site. Uh, we also see nearly half really concerned, that, that, that very to extremely concerned about the reduced availability of workers, whether that's due to mandated shutdowns of the sites, whether that's due to public policies about the number of people gathered in one place, or whether that's due to reduced availability of workers due to illness or quarantine. Um, we asked all of them whether they were actually expecting job sites to be closed for an extended period of time. And we did keep that, we did use that language. We did not give them a specific time frame. And about half said yes. We are, very, we are expecting job sites to be closed for an extended period of time. It made a difference how big of a firm you were in terms of what your expectations were on this question. Small companies were far more likely to expect extended period, extended period closures than were large companies. Now, that may entirely have to do with how small companies versus large companies 
defined extended periods of time, right? You know, um, a two month period might feel very, very long to a small company and feel manageable to a larger company. So um, that may explain why the small companies are so much more concerned about that. But please remember this break this breakout in terms of who makes up that 47% when you see the next slide. Because and we then took all those people who said they were expecting um, job site closings to last for an extended period of time, and we asked them, well, how long do you believe that you can weather a shutdown before having serious concerns about the viability of your business? These are the people who are expecting long shutdowns. We wanted to know what, you know, how long they, they thought they could last as a business. And um, about one in five said that they could last less than a month. Um, and even, you know, over 50% believe that they will not last a full three months, that they can only last between one to three months. So this is a real issue of concern to the industry, even as they have their eyes on the bigger picture, we can see that there, is, there was real concern over how long things would stay shut. Now, we did ask um, several um, open response questions, but we did ask a, what is the single greatest risk to your business that's posed by this outbreak. And interestingly, a lot of the same things do emerge that we saw were concerns in Q1. We see workers still, they, 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 the possibility of workers. However, we see the idea of an economic, and you know, that, that notion of a downturn, we see that even more prominent here, that there's really a big concern about that. We also see materials popping up here much more prominently than they have in the um, recent uh, commercial construction index surveys, that they really are expecting delays on materials, worried about being able to get everything through. So um, it really is kind of telling where they, they see their biggest um, risks. And we actually saw a difference in response between the general contractors and the trade contractors in terms of where they see the single greatest risk. For the general contractors, it's worker availability and economic slowdown and recession that were their big, big issues, where the highest percentage pointed to those. However, a notable percentage, a percentage also said they saw worker health, government mandated shutdowns, and reductions in very specific types of projects. Fewer, um, fewer projects for retail, for instance, showing up. Um, for trade contractors, the two top risks were the, was the health of their workers was number one. Um, in fact, one, one respondent actually chastised us for even asking this question. They thought that obviously everyone would say worker health. And um, government mandated shutdowns was the other one. Although they also, in their other important risks, the uh, worker availability and economic slowdown and recession also show up. And then um, I did want to share with you guys a few of the other top risks that they pointed out. Um, I know this is a kind of long, uh, the text-filled slide, but there were some really interesting things. One is that they were worried about the well-being of their employees, that all of them are really stressed out and there's a lot of fear. They also saw a lot of fear in the marketplace. They were worried about investment in new projects. Um, as the second bullet puts it, Direct virus impacts are survivable, but longer term residual impacts could be much more significant. Um, they were really worried about what's going to happen after projects open, which I know Greg is going to deal with to a great deal, which is, um, you know, incurred costs for additional safety materials and additional hours to complete projects due to distance social distancing requirements. Um, they were worried about, again, maybe the, the types of buildings they do not being um, done as frequently. That's second to the last bullet. Um, a realization that more people can work and learn from home, um, decreasing the need for traditional office and education space. And, um, you know, they're worried about their customers delaying work because the, their businesses have suffered, so they can't afford the expenditures. Really, there was just a lot of different concerns that came out from that question. And then finally, I want to cover the last topic, which is insurance and risk management. So um, for insurance, we wanted, to, we wanted to get a sense of the degree to which they felt that the kind of insurance that they have right now will cover them 
for this kind of unexpected um, consequence on their business. And we asked them how well covered they were on their projects. You know, are they going to be liable for delays, for instance, or will insurance help them cover that? Or um, how live, you know, how covered they were for their businesses in general. And I'm afraid this picture is not very pretty. Very few were confident that they were covered for this situation. Um, around 40% felt that they weren't covered at all. And what's maybe most concerning is that 55% who just are not sure. So they're still in the midst of all of this and they really don't know the degree to which they're gonna be liable and they're gonna have any kind of backstop for the, with the issues that face them in their businesses. Finally, we did ask them about some risk management strategies. And again, we did this as a, um, a, a open response question. And they did talk about process and procedural changes um, that they felt they were going to use to manage risk moving forward, implementing social distancing measures, telecommuting by office staff, implementation of increased sanitation, all the kinds of things you'd expect would be going on. But they also talked about business changes, paying greater attention to, to their insurance in the future. Emphasis on frequent client communications, really trying to build their relationships with the owners they work with better to make sure that they're in a better position if something happens. Maintaining a low overhead, um, was was brought up by several and drawing on external expertise was also a really important strategy that several mentioned. Finally, I'm going to end, this is my last slide, I'm going to end with a picture of the forecast that we brought out in April that was adjusted based on the, um, the what's, what's going, what was going on with the coronavirus. So um, I have to tell you that this was based on GDP assumptions that are, were slightly higher than what, the, than, than what is emerged by, after they did this forecast. So this forecast is a moving target, but I still wanna end with a little bit of good news, which is if you look at uh, the, the, the far right on the chart, 2019, 2020, and 2021, you can see that while you know, there's a huge difference between 2019 and 2020, it doesn't compare to what happened between 2007 and 2010. You know that the that that the, the peaks and the peak and the valleys are just not as extreme right now in terms of what Dodge is expecting. That um, with construction often being considered an essential business, with projects already starting to start up even in hard hit areas, um, and many never having completely shut down, we still see the construction industry while taking a hit from this and certainly struggling through the, the impacts of the recession that it's going to cause for a short time, we still see a rebound by 2021 where we're already starting to see growth coming out of this situation. So with that, let me hand it back to uh, Matt and Dan. Excellent, thank you, Donna. So uh, one of the questions that uh, that we have is around. You mentioned that the uh, that the impact varied by sector, by industry. Is there anything further you can talk about, or the data tells you as far as what industries were impacted and which were not? Right now, I'm not the expert on this. That is um, our forecasting team, but I was privy to what the forecasting team was saying in April, and there was a lot of what you'd expect, um, which is that you know, a certain hotels retail, some of the obvious choices are going to be impacted. A lot of people are keeping their eye on office too. A lot of people feel like we have all been in this out situation long enough that there might be a real question about whether people need as big of an office footprint because there might, there, there, there maybe has been demonstrated that a great deal of productivity can go on with people working from home. So I know that, you know, no one knows for sure, but everybody's kind of keeping an eye on office. Um, and, and, and it's curious to see what happens in that category when we emerge out of it. Um, institutional is not as expected to be hit as, as quickly, but it is expected to be hit on the longer term because state revenues and local revenues will be down. So, you know, there's only so much they're going to be able to invest. So the things that government invests in right now, the, the investments that are already there are fine. But you know that impact will be that will probably lag behind the impact in the commercial market. 
Got it. Okay, so the next question that came in is, it seems like there's uh, some disagreement between the last slide you showed uh, and what people are actually hearing. Uh, and it, the implication here is that uh, things seem to be worse in what they're hearing when they're just doing peer reviews versus what your research showed. Any thought on what could be causing that discrepancy? Well, well, for one thing, you know, we did want to make sure we adjusted the forecast as quickly as possible because there was such a demand for it. But like I said, it's a moving target still. And I know that we're coming out with our mid-year outlooks in then in May, um, that that's something that we're offering. And I'm pretty sure some of the forecast has been, as I said, as is down because like I said, the GDP assumptions are no longer at the same level as they were. But still overall, it really depends on how quickly owners can bounce back and invest in projects. I mean, I think that's really the big question mark. And that's what we're still grappling with, trying to figure it out. Yeah, and, and, and I'll layer in a little bit more because there's a couple questions in here about the, um about projections on healthcare specifically and the uh, and force majeure also. But I'll, I'll start with what we're seeing across our existing customer base in aggregate. Uh, definitely healthcare got hit because uh, most construction is centered around uh, what's not considered not critical, so uh, procedures. And uh, so we're seeing quite a bit of slowdown in the healthcare sector, uh, though that people are starting to go back to work and those those restrictions are starting to ease. Uh, so we do expect the projects to pick back up at healthcare and education in the verticals that we serve definitely had a big slowdown and uh, and not unexpected on the government side. Uh, things are either steady or actually growing and mainly because all the almost all uh, infrastructure projects are deemed critical. So I just wanted to uh, put that in there. Uh, sure. Another question is, uh, uh, do you have any thoughts or does your data talk anything about uh, uh, public-private private partnerships, uh, an increase in those in P3s? No, we don't have any data on that. Sorry. It's, it, it's no, no, an it's fine. Well, we'll hold on also. We'll see how Greg's presentation goes and, and uh, maybe pick it up there. So, uh, I don't think so, but I'll just ask anyways around the uh, force majeure. Anything in any of your data around, because you had your insurance one about not being ready from an insurance perspective, but anything from a uh, for, force majeure perspective? Not yet, but we are actually hoping to do another survey um, probably in another month or so after things really start to, we, more companies start to emerge and the, the picture starts to emerge better. And that is one of the issues we want to look into. Got it. And so the last two I'm going to give you, and then we'll move on to Greg's presentation. These aren't questions. Well, they are questions, but I think they're in the form of requests. So if you could add to your survey specifically hospital CFOs or presidents, so it's specifically to have a dive on the hospital vertical. I've had several questions come in on, on hospitals and see what they think their outlook is. And then another request on aviation. Uh, so I can share that one of our uh, accounts that deals heavily with airports uh, is expected is slowing down a lot of projects because as you can imagine up to 90 percent of air traffic has been stopped and so a lot of the fees aren't being collected so we're hearing um, some concerns in that area until uh, commercial aviation picks back up again so with that mm -hmm. don i want to say thank you and uh and uh, don and i are going to disappear but don't go anywhere to our audience because greg's going to go ahead and pick up so greg if you want to take control of the presentation and and uh, thank you Don. perfect perfect well i appreciate uh and boy your comment there dan as it relates to air travel that really hit home uh so definitely uh something that uh hit for me um, the portion of the program that I'm going to be focusing on is this concept of project refocus. And I changed the name from restart to refocus because I had so many discussions with clients that said, Greg, we're in that category where we were A, deemed essential, or maybe in our state, local government, or area, we were not shut down per se. So this concept of refocusing, because it would be fairly myopic to think that our business wouldn't be adversely affected uh, because of COVID-19. And we're gonna just have to look through a completely different lens. So I wanted to just touch on that. So we're talking about the refocus and the moving forward. 
this I, I, is a little about me. Uh, I am actually a principal with FMI. I've been with FMI for 15 years. Uh, I won't bore you with all that narrative. Uh, short of the fact that I come from the industry uh, prior to coming to FMI, and my specialization is all things operations. Uh, and that particularly means helping my clients perform uh, two best of class standards. And I've been told I have a face that's built for radio. Uh, however, you will get to see me at the end. Uh, but uh, which is a little bit ironic, um, uh, especially as we start talking about how when the gun goes off, this is going to look like a marathon, something that I have never run or seen in my life. So uh, we'll keep that in mind. But uh, a little bit about who FMI is. I know I'm sure probably most of you are familiar, but we are a management consultancy that serves the construction industry and built environment. Uh, some of you have probably used our services for capital advisories, which is you know buying and acquisitions. Uh, I am on the consulting side, which focuses on the area of strategy, leadership development, performance. So let's get into the uh, main point of our discussion today. So, oh. Sorry, my fat fingers moved us a little bit ahead there. But when we look at what we term these countermeasures and this emergency response framework, the concept behind this was looking at it from a two by two matrix, just something that every consultant loves. But I looked at it from this concept of, oh, there you go. Uh, we have a uh, call coming in the background. My apologies. That's uh, the house here. Uh, but we have this two by two matrix which looks at it from not only the internal and external perspective, but also from the short and long term. So when this initial pandemic hit, uh, there was this, you know, what do we do? How do we uh, shut down our projects, our businesses? How do we operate remotely? We're now looking at it from the perspective of there's been a lot of water under the bridge. Uh, you know, the last seven to eight weeks of time has Changed for a lot of folks has uh, maybe allowed us to look at projects slightly different, uh, but we're going to be looking at it from, from the perspective of how do we uh, keep our projects going or how do we restart our projects appropriately. So some of the short-term considerations, and Donna covered uh, many of the concerns that I think a lot of people are having, but we're looking at it specifically from the perspective of short-term project ramifications. So how do we get productively restarted? How do we also manage productivity, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit? It, it's fascinating that one of the top concerns was labor shortages. And in the, the face of this pandemic, we've seen record number of cases of unemployment, yet we're still talking about labor shortages. And the, the, one of the simple definitions I use for many of my clients is the construction industry or built environment uh, moves like a cruise ship. Uh, no pun intended, I might add. Uh, when you think about a cruise ship making that pivot or turn, it doesn't do so uh, much like a, a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. Uh, getting that whole engine restarted and uh, energized is much different for our business. Uh, it, just getting that productivity back to where we need it to be is different. Um, we talk about supply chain issues, and we're going to mention that a little bit later, but transportation uh, that's of the people as well, and probably almost importantly, of our pieces and parts and all of the materials we need to do our work. We also have these concerns about communicability and the, any COVID resurgence, compliance monitoring. And what I mean by that, not monitoring of COVID-19, but any standards we're going to set in place. We don't want it to be empty paper. We want it to be something that uh, we can document but doesn't become cumbersome. We want it to be something that holds us accountable but doesn't uh, penalize. There's so many av avenues we need to be thinking about with compliance. Additionally, the availability of PPE. I'm sure many of you were gracious uh, and donated to uh, you know, first responders in the medical community. Well, as we get back to work, uh, what are we going to do? And we have some of the other items on the right-hand side. So are our projects the one that were shut down? Will they actually get restarted? What about from an owner or general contractor uh, liquidity? What about our trade partners? Do, do they have the tolerance? And you see some of the numbers that Donna shared. You know, when we say our, our balance sheet wasn't as strong as we'd like it to be, can we weather the storm? Uh, Long-term supply chain issues, those 
those uh, long lead items from China or the Asian subcontinent, uh, or uh, where we start talking about uh, getting materials from Europe. Those are considerations. Inspections in our municipalities, you know, you, uh, Donna discussed that as well. And lastly, the two items that typically come up are long-term customer budgeting of that next project. And lastly, what are those contractual obligations and legal interpretations we need to consider? So we said when the starting gun goes off worldwide, this is going to look a lot like the New York City Marathon. Uh, and like I said, this is about as close as I get. Um, we can't disregard the fact that COVID-19 has done some sort of harm uh, to just about every aspect of our society, worker psyche, supply chains, the economy, work sequencing. Um, how we get this project restarted is what we need to be thinking about. Also, as I said already, even if our project was not delayed, we have to be thinking about how do we make those right project decisions, the right project strategy to drive us towards successful conclusion. So this eye chart that I created, uh, and once again, uh, at the end, you'd be more than happy to uh, email me uh, and I'll provide this for you. And I know uh, through uh, the, the website that has all of our information, uh, you will see a representation, only because I'm sure a lot of you are trying to scribble or take screenshots. I don't want anyone getting carpal tunnel syndrome. But the moral of this story here is, as the, the great Yogi Berra once said, when you're at the fork in the road, you need to take it. Uh, well, we're at this red arrow. And the idea here is, is work permitted on our job site? And you have the upper fork and the lower fork. These different forks are the things that we're going to look at as we go forward in this conversation. But what does our value stream map look like? I know another great consultant uh, tool from our toolbox, but folks, this level of our recipe book is absolutely what is needed to deal with these critical restarts. So we're gonna look at some of the different pieces to give you some perspective. Um, first of all, when we start talking about communicating from a hygienic standpoint, uh, do we have the right level of signage on our job sites? To even illustrate what good hygiene means. And I think it's ironic that I'm talking to about 350 adults uh, about hygiene in, in 2020. But um, when we think about what's gonna be required for our job sites. Now, a lot of you have already instituted things like this, or maybe you see that wash station in the bottom right-hand corner. And you're saying, well, we're doing that already, Greg. Well, some of the things we have to understand, this is not only about following our labor agreements or what's allowed under HIPAA, uh, but more importantly, we need to be thinking about the messaging. So uh, just to give you some, for instance, uh, I am in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, and as uh, there was, I think it was the other day, there was a piece on one of the local channels. And uh, it was sort of a gotcha piece. And the gotcha piece uh, sort of got a couple of contractors that weren't practicing social distancing. Uh, now, ironically enough, in, in those... Uh, video uh, montage that they showed. There were also OSHA violations, but we're not going there. Uh, the moral of the story is if we're telling the community at large that we need uh, to work, uh, we need to get back to work, uh, that we need to do um, these things to, to kind of move the economy forward, yet we step on ourselves uh, in the sense that uh, we're doing those silly things. We're not monitoring or, or figuring out how to uh, maintain that social distancing guidelines. That, that unfortunately is shame on us. So part of that is for us to not only have these signs, but find ways to hold people accountable and monitor it. Uh, additionally, as you know, many of my clients have tried to look at going paperless for years. And it's funny as they've gone paperless, they added more paper. Well, many clients of mine are now saying we are fully burning the boats of the shore and finding ways to move forward in this paperless world. Additionally, the part of this is the, that I would say is the, what I would say the, the absolute meat of this discussion is this concept of the restart or refocus meeting, where we, it almost resembles that of a pre-construction strategy meeting. Uh, and I'm not talking about the ones that we do kind of the dump and go, or we uh, have a pencil whipping exercise where we say we got our plans, check, we got our submittal list, check. Uh, equipment, yep, got it. We're talking about deep conversations about things like labor projections, those supply chains. What does the critical path look like now? What are the owner needs? Uh, maybe owner FF&E, which we'll talk about in a moment, as well as any third-party impacts. And 
once again, I did create another eye chart, um, and my apologies in advance, but this is a sample restart agenda meeting that I've created to help many of my clients kind of get back to work. Um, and you can see some of the questions. I'm not going to read this list to you, but you get to see some of the very important pieces uh, that we want to ask and ask those deep probative questions early and often. Additionally, we look at the supply chain and the idea of going through every single material item uh, and making sure that we understand what that lane looks like. What about uh, as it relates to inspections that may they may have to undergo in different ports? Uh, I'm sure one of the questions that's going to come up is, uh, well, can we accelerate shipping? Well, we've seen that many of our supply chains, especially domestically, uh, are impacted. So the, the simple fact of asking someone to accelerate when we're already trying to do the best thing we can, and I'm just going by Amazon Prime, of course. Uh, all that being said, we then have to look at what is the, the impact to our general condition. And you'll see this list has only got five or six items, mainly because I also didn't want another eye chart. But this is the level we're going to have to use for every single item. Don't forget that we're also thinking about uh, some of the smaller items that we probably would have discounted. Maybe a, a hardware, and a, maybe not an exotic hardware, but uh, you know stuff that we probably assumed was off the shelf. Um, additionally, when we start talking about uh, making sure that we have things like our PPE covered. So let's say we're putting in our uh, epoxy coatings. Well, we got our epoxy, but now we don't have the PPE to do that. So there, we have to make sure all the bases are covered and do not leave this a chance, otherwise it will fall through the cracks. Additionally, one of my favorite pictures is a histogram. Maybe it's just the orange and blue uh, coming from Florida that is. But uh, when we look at this labor histogram, we see what those demands are to our labor pool. Doing this and then looking at the overall impact based on the revised schedule. And this shows, well, no uh, change to the end date per se. Now, the part of this discussion we can't forget is simply just saying, let's throw more bodies at it. And I'm sure we've all heard that before. We'll throw more bodies at it. Well, we also know that doesn't improve productivity. The moral of the story is we're going to have to think very differently about all the labor considerations as well as productivity. So when we start looking at the cost impact uh, due to a poor restart, for instance, and the, the graph on the right-hand side shows you a yellow and a blue bar, it shows the cost. And that is the cost related to not only starting later, but also having a potential, uh, potentially weak productivity when we kick off. We also are going to see some things. We, we can't overpopulate areas as much as we may try. What about workflow and sequencing, uh, revised inspection schedule? You know, we're saying here that, you know, if we do this wrong, this could have a 10% decrease in our labor productivity, thus vaporizing all our profit margins. The point of this that I wanted to say is when we look at all this, we need to understand that this is the reason why we need to do it right. So when we're also going through, and a lot of this is very similar to things we've talked about, but going through and not only doing that as part of our restart meeting, but then sitting and saying, well, let's look at our CPM schedule. What does that look like? So going through this checklist piece by piece and not only making sure it's accounted for in our CPM schedule, but what are the ramifications? And a couple of the key items on here I wanted to touch on, utility startups. We've talked about inspections already in our municipalities, but what about the impact as it relates to the water or sewer? or electric. These are all things that we cannot forget that they were impacted as well, as well as owner FF&E. Those are all the items that we probably should have to make sure our CPM schedule is accurately showing the picture of the world. So now is also a great time to look at our submittal log. Make sure maybe these are the opportunities for those alternates we proposed or value engineering. But what are these delays doing to the overall procurement process? Once again, that's why we show it on our CPM schedule. Additionally, when we start talking about cash flow and billings, you know, this is the other part of this. We looked at the cost side, but let's not also forget what does this do in terms of our internal cash flow? Uh, do we have a 12-month rolling schedule that shows that cash flow? Many of you will probably say, 
Well, Greg, we do that as a best practice for our firm. However, I'm telling you to do a 12 month cash flow projection for every project. Uh, also accounting for things like overtime, shipping, supply chain. Are we also considering the other things like bonding and insurance, any additional builder's risk policies? What about those state of unapproved change orders pre COVID? Uh, you know, obviously if they were kind of lingering out there, what is our likelihood of collecting on those now if they're still unapproved? These are all the things that, with the kind of the bottom line premise of what is the state of the customer. So giving you a, another series of charts to kind of just get some perspective, and this is another part of the tool that should be in our restart toolbox, looking at the cash flow projections based on the new forecast, uh, also looking at that red triangle, and oh boy, here it is again, uh, we're going to talk about the airlines. No, I'm talking about the Delta, and the Delta here is the shift that's taking place, focusing on the Delta, how do we stack up? So leave it to the operations guy to bring this one into vogue. Uh, the question, and this actually came from my previous life, but we would ask one of our superintendents, his name was John. We would say, hey, John, are you done? And he would say, yep, we're done, except for these 42 punch list items. And then the question would be, are you done done? And I know all of you on this webinar are great at getting done done. However, now is an excellent time to be looking at our exit strategy making sure we get to the finish line and not having that usual procrastination as it relates to punch list, ASVL, closeout documents. The other question you need to be asking yourself is, uh, when we start talking about punch list, closeouts, DMOB, and most importantly, final cleaning, what does that mean in this new normal as it relates to cleaning and hygiene? Now, I'm sure some of you will say, well, if that customer wants me to completely sanitize the job site, they're going to have to pay for it. And I, I probably don't disagree with you. Um, there are two things you need to think about, though, folks. Number one, uh, let's not run a marathon and at mile 26 determine that we still have three more miles to go. And by the way, there's only 26 miles in a marathon or thereabouts. Uh, the reason I bring that up is if this is going to be the new normal, let's determine that now, not when we're getting ready to hand the keys over and collect our retention. And number two, don't forget that final cleaning is done by cleaning companies in most cases. A lot of those folks are very busy. So once again, if we're not looking ahead and being proactive, we may not have people to do the cleaning. Uh, point of this is to make sure we don't leave anything to chance. This is the pre-construction planning process for the last 10%. So uh, all of us need to be thinking about not only how do we get to done, but also at the end, Let's put all these lessons learned in our lessons learned library that all of you have and diligently update. Let's not let this pandemic go to waste. And I think, as Donna said before, when we looked at those charts from 2008, one of the things that comes up is, wow, there was probably a lot of things we learned back then and maybe we're applying those lessons now. We never wanna have another COVID-19 or COVID-20 or whatever number we're up to. My, my point is we need to be thinking about the future, but capturing those right lessons learned. So a couple notes on the future from FMI's perspective. Our job now is to look at all at-risk clients and projects. Uh, so scrutinizing the billings and collections, watching upstream as well as watching our trade partners downstream. Simply put, no one's gonna predict how this is affecting every business. We'd like to think everyone has a superb balance sheet, but the reality is that's not the case. Um, the point is there are businesses, some of which that have high fixed costs that are going to struggle to rebound possibly because they are more of a fixed cost business. Uh, additionally, getting smart on some of the market sector impacts, as Donna indicated before, you know, looking at the figures that are provided from the experts to say, what is the prediction for these, this market sector, that market sector? Uh, learning about things like demand elasticity. Leave it to Greg to bring up a subject from high school economics. But what about our customers and business that have this concept of demand elasticity or inelasticity and, and using that to help forecast our business differently? Do we have a performance dashboard that lets us not only take a project that may be uh, looking good, but then we start to go, yeah, it went in at, let's say 10%, but 
They haven't collected. Their change orders are outstanding, yada, yada, yada. It, this is, may need to be on life support uh, for us to, to finish as strong as we'd like. And lastly, folks, now's not the time to have folks that are being cowboys and cowgirls. I just finished an excellent book on Tombstone and Wyatt Earp. We, we don't need a bunch of cowboys and rogues out there gunslinging it. We need to make sure they're following the brand X way of doing things, which is why we have these roadmaps and tools to help us do it effectively. Lastly, boy, I was going to put a picture of me running the marathon, but I decided not. Uh, the point of this is to say, thinking about our restart is also going to help us effectively finish this project successfully. Uh, when the signal gun goes off, there's also going to be this mass rush, uh, hopefully, uh, and also dealing with the new rules that we're all learning on a daily basis. The other part of this is just getting active again, just putting shovels in the ground does not necessarily signify productivity. Uh, when we start talking about productivity, we need to be looking and understanding a, that five-person crew may have to be a four-person crew to social distance. But we also may save some, but we also may lose some efficiency because they spend the first 15 minutes cleaning and gowning in, almost like a surgical team, and then the same thing at the end of the day. The point is, know your cost and analyze and understand where everything stands. We can't overstate this impact to the supply chain. Even the simplest, most ordinary commodity item can end up biting us if we're not on top of it. Cash is king, always and forever. Uh, and once again, it shouldn't take this pandemic to remind us of that. Uh, for our, getting our projects over the finish line and crossing that ribbon, we need to understand this is going to be like pre-planning or the two-minute warning of the big game. And lastly, folks, this is not just a message for project teams, but for all leaders in general. Be seen, be visible, communicate and be out front, even if it is just six feet. Um, I am actually going to turn it back over to, to my team now. Uh, this is me. If you have any questions or would like to reach out to me or, heck, if you just want to know if Florida's open. Uh, that being said, I am going to click to here and also open my webcam so you can see my athletic physique. So uh, that being said, Dan. Excellent. Thanks, Greg. So a couple questions came in. Uh, one is if you have any thoughts on uh, this is specifically about artificial intelligence, applica artificial intelligence applications. But I'm going to broaden a little bit and just say, is there the opportunity for technologies to be used to offset some of the productivity impacts that you mentioned in your presentation? Absolutely. And, and this is probably not necessarily specific artificial intelligence, but I, I think one of the things, as we all know, our industry has maybe not been, uh, and the industry I'm referring to is construction, obviously, uh, not been as forward thinking and adopting new technology, except the 350 people on the webinar right now. But um, that being said, what I think, the, this is another upside of this uh, challenging marketplace. It's shown us that, A, we can do a lot of things with technology we never thought before. Uh, you know, we were maybe just clipping the white cap. So whether we're talking about, uh, you know, using AI, whether we're, uh, you know, using, you know, webcams differently, we're using, uh, you know, cameras to do virtual inspections, which I've heard quite frequently, um, or even, you know, getting, thinking about the, using autonomous systems uh, differently. This is folk, this is a time where folks are saying, hey, let's let's really push the envelope because we still have to manage our companies and do it well. Obviously, we have to keep the budget in mind, but I think uh, so many of my really best in class clients are really looking at that now. Got it. And the uh, uh, second question you mentioned about uh, uh, burning the boats at the shore and, and moving away from paper. I just be curious because uh, one of the things we discussed in some of the earlier webinars in the series was specifically in the owner marketplace, a lot of owners had not invested in a uh, cloud-based system to manage projects. And so when they weren't allowed to go to the office, they ran into problems. I'm just curious what anything to uh, layer in on that. Yeah, I think uh, the, one, when I, the, the comment of you know, where we maybe accepted uh, you know, paper time cards, and I'm just using that as a for instance, or submitting paper applications to an owner. Well, 
The owners kind of shut the doors. You know, our office won't accept paper. Uh, if you want to get paid, if you're sending in shipping receipts, it all has to be done electronically, mainly because I'm also not going to the office. Um, so I think it's pushing us to the limits. Now, I'm sure everyone probably has a little apathy right now as it relates to, you know, doing Zoom meetings and things like that. It's, it's changed the, you know, the, the landscape a little bit. But I also think people are realizing that, hey, we can use these things make them more effective. It pops up in my email that I have to approve this invoice or uh, furnish colors. And more importantly, it's creating a strong level of documentation that, wow, ooh, they can actually show this. And whether I'm in the, the, the operating system that my client's using, there's a level of transparency that we didn't maybe have before. So I, I do think there's a, a lot of upside and it's probably pushing us to the 21st century a lot quicker uh, and adopting things we maybe didn't think or we said, oh, that's that'll be in 2030. Well, we're doing it now in 2020. Got it. Perfect. And I know I, I have there's some other great questions in here, but I need to bring us in for a landing. We will follow up on, on these questions. A couple points before I call my colleague Matt to introduce next week's topic, because some of the questions that people are asking are the entire reason why we have next week's topic. Uh, so I just first want to say thank you, Greg. Phenomenal presentation. I love your your style. Thank and you. Papers. It was great. The uh, so a couple of things. People have asked for copies of the presentations. The one thing I want to let you know is we will send uh, a link to the underlying uh, research projects that both Donna used for her presentation and Greg used for his presentation. So everybody would get a copy of it, which is what all the slides were based off of. So we will um, get that out to you. And the other thing that I just want to mention also is we had four webinar series, four webinars prior to this series. A lot of your questions were, in fact, the last one was about uh, the new normal and, and uh, what's life going to be like. We covered that topic several times in some of those prior webinars. I encourage you to go and, and check out those uh, earlier webinars. We had customers talking about those impacts. The last thing I want to mention is another partner. So Dodge Data Analytics and FMI have been phenomenal partners of ours for years. There's another great partner called COA, the Construction Owners Association of America. And one of the things that, that they're starting to talk about is that owners need to be uh, mindful of the fact that if a whole bunch of projects in the same geography restart at the exact same time, you're going to create a supply and demand problem, which could increase, in fact, there's projections of up to 15% increase in premiums because of a labor shortage. So just be mindful for the owners on the call that you may want to coordinate with other owners in your area to try to sequence how quickly you're going to put projects back out, back out to uh, back out to bid or restart. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to my colleague Matt to introduce next week's topic. Thank you, Dan, and everybody. I know I got about 30 seconds, so I'm going to move through this uh, in respect of everybody's time. So uh, so this week. We, with the way we framed it, although conversations may have led down uh, some other some other avenues, uh, was really about exploring what to expect. And next week, the second episode of the series within a series, if you will, um, will focus on exactly what will need to be done. So we've got some three fantastic uh, presenters uh, with Andrea Berry and Mark uh, from CMAA, La Patner and Associates, and Deloitte, respectfully. Um, and, you know, they're really going to be diving into, you know, that, that the old ways of doing business is really no longer sufficient, um, whether it's dealing with new ways of contracting, looking at ways, uh, new ways of risk management, um, and additionally getting back into the question that we, we, we kind of finished up with was, was, was around productivity. So I hope you'll all enjoy, uh, enjoy us. Join us uh, next week, uh, same time, same place, same channel. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you in a week. And the only thing I want to mention before we hang up is Maggie just posted the link. So those that are interested in registering and getting an early seat into next week's webinar, it's in the chat. Go ahead and click, and you'll be able to see more details about next week, as well as links to all of the prior four webinars I just mentioned. So I join uh, Matt in saying thank you to our speakers. Thanks to everyone for joining us, and have a wonderful day. So